Thank you um, for inviting us to speak. I'm, I'm from Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike, and we're based locally at the Crossroads Women's Center. Um, I would say, uh, I wanted to just start by saying something about Gaza, because I feel like, you know, it's very much in our hearts and minds, and it, it's very good that the bombing has stopped finally, but the massacre and the slow genocide continue, and the ethnic cleansing continues. 90% um, of the water in, in Gaza is polluted and unfit for human beings. And I think that we have got to have the people of Gaza, the Palestinians, in mind, because there's no economic solutions for any of us as long as that slaughter continues. And um, we're working with a group called the IJAN, the International uh, Jewish Anti-Zionist Network, and they've been protesting against the JNF, which is um, the Jewish National Fund. It's a fund that masquerades as um, an environmental group, but in fact has been involved in stealing Palestinian lands and even barring Palestinians from entering those lands. So uh, we would be really glad for support on that particular issue. Um, as I said, we've been based at the Crossroads Women's Center since 1977, and our first center was in fact just behind the town hall uh, here in Hundred Street. Um, well, we're also part of a network that is across the UK in Guyana, Peru, Haiti, India, Africa, Canada, and the US. And we, we very much are shaped by the uh, global situation that we are in. Our, our main um, demand is for an investing, investing in caring, not killing. And that means that the resources squandered on war must go instead into our communities, first of all to women and children, uh, for the caring of people in the planet. And that means starting with mothers who are the main carer, carers and make sure that communities survive. Um, I think the, the three quick points that I'm going to try to summarize um, are uh, who are the 99%, how women contribute, and what we do in the center. Um, as George spoke earlier about Occupy, and uh, Occupy, among the important things that it did, it really established the figure of the 99%. And what for us that means is that we all belong together. Um, now the work is to spell out who is the 99%, who's doing the work, and who's sustaining the environment. The UN said about 20 years ago that women do two-thirds of the world's work, and that hasn't changed, uh, unfortunately. Women are doing most of that work unpaid. It's often on the land. It's growing food and ensuring food security. And that's under threat by the theft of land, by cash crops, by war, environmental devastation. The people who work the hardest in the world and are in the most extreme situations are most hardest hit by the uh, climate change and environmental destruction. In Africa, women grow 80% of the food that's eaten on the continent. In India, women do 60 to 80% of the agricultural work. Indigenous women everywhere are uh, protectors of the environment and are really fighting against being told that they're not even supposed to exist. Women do more health care than all the hospitals in the world combined. Uh, I want to say very quickly about our, our sisters in Guyana and Red Thread have been uh, organizing against flood devastation. They carried out a survey into women's unpaid work, and they want they use that to press for money and resources and compensation for the flood victims. They came up against the NGOs, particularly the Red Cross, who they described throwing food into dirty water because the Red Cross workers were not prepared to walk in the, in, in the chest deep water which the people were dealing with. And so, you know, we really also have to call out the NGOs and charities. Uh, in India, uh, there's a, a group in Chhattisgarh. They are Dalit, Dalit and tribal women in the state of Chhattisgarh, and they've been campaigning against rape to win bonded labor. They've got thousands of people released. They have also been organizing against flooding, and they use counting on wage work to, to win a monthly 40 kilogram rice subsidy for unmarried, widowed, and divorced women with no income. And in Haiti, uh, Haiti's talked about as the poorest country in the Western world, instead of as the first country to end slavery. And they have been uh, up against coups, invasions, and environmental disasters brought on by IMF and World Bank policy.
policies. Um, they have also been up against UN forces who are policing the country. The UN have a budget of over 535 million annually. They've also they've been responsible for rape and kill, many killings in Haiti. Yet the average Haitian wage is two pounds a day, and 70% of families are headed by women, most of those women unwaged. And so uh, the people of Haiti have a huge, um, they're just up against a huge fight. And we, I, I think it's important that we have Haiti in mind in our organizing here. There, right now there's an epidemic of cholera that was brought by UN troops. The people are uh, pressing for uh, compensation um, you know, from the UN for the, the devastation that that's caused. And in Haiti, the, the Red Cross and other charities have collected millions and millions from around the world, you know, based on the compassion that people felt for Haiti. And yet, people are still living in tents without clean water, without health care. And the, the women especially have been campaigning to expose the role of the NGOs and literally robbing Haiti of the resources that the people need. Um, I'll just mention Peru as well, where domestic workers have fought for um, their indigenous and rural women who've been forced off the countryside into the cities, and they want an ILO convention to recognize domestic work as work, because for many years, domestic work has not been counted as work, and that's another way that we can work off as women. Um, so it's really urgent that we get these kind of contributions acknowledged because women in the third world are giving us a huge amount of leadership, uh, the fantastic struggles which we need. We need here, we really need that information, then it can help us and strengthen us in what we're trying to achieve. Our work at the center is shaped by all this. Um, we're informed by those struggles. Um, and many of us are immigrants. Some of us have our asylum seekers who've had to flee from torture and devastation in our home countries. Uh, some of us are women with disabilities. There are two anti-rape organizations. There's a single mother's group. Um, there's a men's group that supports the work of the center. Our, our principle is anti-racism and anti-sexism, that nobody's needs should be prioritized over anybody else's and based on self-help. What we learn from our struggles and our campaigns and our casework, we, um, we try to <coughs> stay and make that available to other people. Um, what we're seeing and, and what we hope that the, the green and environmental movement will want to take into account is that we're seeing uh, women and children who have not eaten all day. In the UK, one in five mothers is, is skipping a meal to be able to you know, feed their children. Uh, women are unable, families are unable to pay bills, are hounded by bailiffs, cannot afford to heat their homes. We're seeing more homelessness, homelessness more people on the streets. Uh, what was done to asylum seekers um, around 2000 when they cut benefits from asylum seekers is now being extended to everybody else. Um, people are people on housing benefits are under threat of being uh, forced out of London to places where they don't know anybody, where they have no friends, uh, and children taken away from their schools. Uh, women are being driven into sex work to survive and then criminalized. People are being criminalized by ASPOs. Our kids are targeted. The police are rampaging to try to, you know, as the more we protest, the police are being called on to come keep us down. And um, uh, there are three cases on at the moment. There's a mother who's been, her family's been targeted for three generations. The police just broke her arm, raided her house, and broke her arm in the process. And we're trying to help her claim compensation for that. And she herself is charged, and we're trying to get the charges dropped. Um, there's another mother who's fighting for access to her grandchild. We're seeing more children under threat of being taken into care. Um, another woman, there's a leaflet outside, a mother who's fighting for her severely disabled son um, not to be put in prison. He nearly died because the, the prison had absolutely no facilities. And um, she's had a lot of support. It's broken by the sign of petition. There's an online petition for that. Um, I'll just finish by two quick points. One is the, the point about the environmental jobs. Um, we know that many well-intentioned well people are working on that, but we think it's important that that, that struggle has got to be connected with the fight to keep our welfare benefits, because otherwise you can be in a situation where the environmental jobs are used to further drive people um, off benefits and into kind of workfare schemes. 
So we don't want the, that to be turned against us. And the only way to do that is to make sure that those campaigns are working together, liaising together, and, and making sure that we all get the resources we need. Um, we believe we're entitled. We think that's self-evident. We have a right to life, to liberty, to happiness. Um, and that is not what the market stands for. As if we can prioritize life and caring, then we prioritize the planet and the environment. But if we prioritize the market, then we prioritize genocide and suicide, as the first speaker said this morning. We are, uh, when we talk about global warming, we must think about the arms trade and the destruction that that does to the climate and to us as people. And um, we don't want the free market to be in charge of us. We want us, grassroots people, to be in charge of our own destiny. Uh, we have to defeat the free market, militarism, and war. And we need the green movement to be seen to be anti-racist and anti-sexist, to be standing with and taking a lead from third world people, and, and women of color in particular, in particular, who are, you know, we're often treated as more backward, but in fact, our, our communities are the least polluting and often have all kinds of ideas for um, to protect the environment, which are not being taken into account. Um, uh, I'll finish there, and I hope there might be time for a few questions for people that aren't able to come to our workshop.